I think Biden is absolutely horrendous on the Middle East. And the same with Blinken. You can't even compare. You can't even begin to compare Blinken and Kerry, but you might. So I don't think they're the same. I think they both suck. Okay. <laughs> and I don't think the Democratic, at least the last two Democratic presidents, actually understand the Middle East and the Arab mentality. Mm -hmm. We keep hearing about ceasefire. Why is that the headline all the time from this administration and not enough about hostages need to be returned? The more that Joe Biden or Tony Blinken or any of these guys gets up and talks about indiscriminate bombing or over-the-top actions or demands a ceasefire, it causes the price for the hostages to go up. Yeah. It causes Hamas to be emboldened and it's prolonging the very thing that these Democrats want to end. Welcome back to another week of The Quad here on JNS. Be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube every week for the new episode. Today we are in studio with Ashira Solomon, political commentator, Vivian Berkovich, the main event and founder of the state of Tel Aviv, as well as the former Canadian ambassador. And remotely, we have the one and only Floor Hassan Nahum, who is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem, amongst many other things. And on the agenda today, we are discussing the U.S.-Israel relations in the aftermath of multiple incidents, State of the Union, the hot mic from Biden. And this is the question, is the U.S.-Israel relationship in crisis? Vivian, what's your take? Um, my take is yes, seems to be. Um, it's a crisis, though, that's been roiling and brewing for quite some time. Um, but wars do seem to accentuate the urgency and the immediacy of everything I think that overall, um, he's, he and Blinken have been very supportive of Israel, um, extremely. And in the face of incredible international pressure and resistance and domestic pressure and resistance. And the fact is, Benjamin Netanyahu plays politics in Israel and uh, panders to his base. And Biden's going to do the same. And he is doing that. But I think that he has gone to the mats and beyond for Israel. So... The real problem has been, in my view, the really serious way, way problems, I had to use the same word twice, but I have to, really serious problems in the manner in which um, BB and the IDF have handled this war, the lack of planning for the day after, um, a few fiascos that I'm not gonna sort of tease out, and the hostage issue. Mm -hmm. And they've lost confidence of the people in Israel doesn't mean we're not united in wanting to defeat Hamas and bring home hostages, but there is no unity around this government. Sure. And I think that Biden needs this government to behave more cooperatively. Fleur, what's your take? Well, it's very difficult for me to think that the U.S.-Israel relationship is in crisis because I'm here at the APAC conference, and I'm here, there's two, 3,000 people here, many senators, many Congress people, and it's hard to think that we're in crisis with what I've seen in the last two days of this conference, because I've seen from both sides of the aisle, so many people here, supportive of Israel, supportive of the war, and yes, there are scuffles between Biden and Bibi, and yes, perhaps, Biden should not have said, and I think he was also taken a little bit out of context, The BB's bad or what BB's doing is bad. It was, it had a particular context and it wasn't a good thing. He shouldn't have said that. He shouldn't interfere in internal politics, just like we shouldn't interfere in American internal politics. Um, and perhaps there is that kind of really uncomfortable leader to leader situation. But let me tell you, from the leadership of the political leadership here in Washington, to the Jewish communities here, to what I've seen in APAC. This is a relationship that may go through its ups and downs, but it's a very, very solid relationship. I'm not concerned after being here for two days. Ashira, what's your take? Was one of two Americans here. <laughs> I'm curious what your take is. I like Vivian's point about Biden having to pander to his base a little bit, that everyone has to pander to their base. And we are, you know, America's in an election year and he wants to be reelected. And I think he's trying to pander to his base um, and continue to have, you know, Muslim support in Michigan and also, you know, keep the right, you know, moderates on his side as well. What I'm concerned about is his tonality, like not being balanced. Um, I, I wish I would see him t 
you know, take a strong leadership stance for his base to come out and say, hey, the hostages need to be returned. Mm -hmm. We keep hearing about ceasefire. Why is that the headline all the time from this administration and not enough about hostages need to be returned? Just like I would love to see on our side that we call on Palestinians to st take a stand against Hamas. So I would like to see more of a stance of hostages need to be returned as our messaging. And from here that, hey, Palestinians, you guys need to step up and take a strong stance against Hamas. I have not been particularly impressed with Biden or Blinken um, on this issue, uh, but in particular in the Middle East, far beyond Israel. I mean, I think Biden's statements, especially at the beginning, were very strong. Yeah. I think he, he's been excellent on Israel's support at first. Now, I'm not really so sure. It seems like, like you mentioned, he's sort of pandering to the base, which I think is a bit too much, because when we're talking about the Democrats who oppose Israel, it's it's a minority. It's still a pretty small minority. And you mentioned Michigan. It's They're a very extreme yes. Democratic base. I don't think that's Biden's base. I don't even think it's the base of the Democratic Party. No, it might be the future, but it's unfortunately. A really state. But it's yeah. a very important it state. It is an important state. Yeah, it yeah. is an important state. But I think a lot of it is politically motivated. For? But they're, who are they going to vote for? Trump? I mean, well, the, you know, he, yeah. that's their who, dilemma. Who, who they won't show up. For? That's the concern of the Democrats. That's, yeah, that's yeah. their dilemma. But I mean, yeah, exactly. If they yeah. don't show up or spoil ballots, then that's going to uh, help Trump. Yeah. But I think the main issue for me isn't, isn't even that. I mean, it's that Biden has said a lot of things, even since he came into office, and he has done another. And we saw this with the Iran issue. That Biden has been, the whole administration has been extremely weak on Iran from day one. Yeah. And you can't be supportive of Israel and also be okaying the transfer of $6 billion in frozen assets to the Islamic Republic. There's no such thing as being pro-Israel, but also giving money to the people who are funding terrorism. And then we see the same sort of arguments over UNRWA and over some of the aid to the Palestinian Authority. I mean, one of Biden's first things was restoring the funding to UNRWA. Yeah. And, and it's not like these reports are new. It's just more of them have come to light as a result of October 7th. So how can you say that that's supportive of Israel when he's talking out both sides of his mouth? I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not buying it. And it's not any partisan line because I yeah. think there are a lot of Democrats who are very good on this issue. But I, I think Biden is absolutely horrendous on the Middle East. And the same with Blinken. I mean, him and Obama, which is no surprising, are, are really the same policy when it comes to these issues. And I'm no fan of Netanyahu or this Israeli government. But that doesn't change the fact that I think that Biden is a weak leader who has enabled the Islamic Republic to expand their capabilities. I don't think that we would have seen the same actions that we saw uh, if Trump was president, and I'm no fan of Trump either, right. but but Biden is a weak president on foreign policy, and, and that costs lives. Yeah. And and that's my concern here. It's not just about Israel. It's, it's about the wider issue beyond just the U.S.-Israel relationship, I think. I would say, uh, I, I wanted to say that I think that I'm not sure it's about Biden being weak. It's just that the Democratic Party have a very unrealistic view of the Middle East in general. So we saw this with Obama and we're seeing this with Biden. They look at the Middle East through their liberal lenses and they don't understand that we're living in the roughest neighborhood in the world. And they also don't understand that in the Arab world, might is right and it's mm -hmm. the strength you project. And the more strong you are, the bigger stance you take, the more the Arab world will actually respect you. Saudi Arabia wants to make peace with Israel or wanted to make peace with Israel because we're perceived or were perceived as strong. That's why the UAE and that's why Bahrain wanted peace with Israel. They don't make peace with, with us from a point that we're weak. And I don't think the Democratic in general, the Democratic, at least the last two Democratic presidents, actually understand the Middle East and the Arab mentality. All right, I got to jump in and, you know, play diplomat. Um, so one point I want to make just very quickly is that I think that your relationship can be in a crisis and it can still have strong fundamentals, right? Marriages pass through that kind of thing, right? Every kind of relationship. And that's the same with state to state. I know that when I was in office in 2014 and uh, that was the war with Gaza and things were very, very, very testy between uh, Obama and Bibi at the time um, and John Kerry. Um, I mean, Blinken, you can't even compare, you can't even begin to compare Blinken and Kerry, but 
You might. But True. I won't let you. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, there was this point. It was a I don't week. think they're the same. I think they both suck. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, here's yeah, where I'm going to try to be the diplomat. I'm going to try to... I'm going to try and flirt. I hear you. You're absolutely, you're all right. I love everybody. But <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> these guys have to make something work in this impossible environment, the diplomatic environment, the global environment. I happen to think that in the context of the current global environment, they've stood by Israel and the UN, they vetoed um, a lot of um, bad things in the Security Council. They have kept the aid coming. They have taken, they have expedited aid. And this was the point I, I was going to make in 2014, the summer of 2014, when Israel was down to really its last batteries for the Iron Dome and desperately, desperately needed them. And that's when, you know, John Kerry and uh, Obama started flexing their biceps and wagging their finger and, and withheld. They said, we're withholding. It was all theater, of course. And this goes to the point that we're all making, which is the strength of the underlying relationship, because the strength between the RDF and the Pentagon, the strength of that relationship, mm -hmm. no matter who's in office, it's on its yeah. own. It's on its own momentum. It's on its own track. Yeah. yeah. And they just the Pentagon made sure Israel had what it needed. And Obama was, you know, saying all these, you know, inappropriate things. Well, we are running short on time on this topic, but um, I know we have a very special guest who um, is very closely related to this issue. Fleur, you wanna you wanna introduce our guest this week? So we're very lucky to have somebody who's actually been very vocal on the relationship, on the rhetoric used in America, and how that could actually embolden uh, the Hamas and the, and the bad guys. And so it's really our pleasure to have on the show this week. Ambassador David Friedman. Ambassador Friedman, thank you so much for coming in to thank speak you. to us. So good to be with you. So Ambassador Friedman, I just got back from APAC. I've been there for the last uh, few days. I got a very positive feeling, to be honest. And I wanted to ask you, as somebody who was the ambassador to uh, Israel from the United States, who was intricately involved in the relationship, are we in crisis? I think we're heading there, yeah. If we're not there already, I think we're heading there. Um, uh, it's exacerbated um, because it's an election year, right? So, so that that kind of puts everything into a much, much higher, uh, much higher focus. But I think, um, look, the um, the Democratic Party is not the Democratic Party of my parents, you know, who were loyal Democrats, or uh, uh, even the way that I grew up. I mean, it has a component which is getting increasingly uh, vocal and extraordinarily hostile to Israel for, you know, for a million reasons that we don't have time to get into, but it's, it's not fringe. That component could for a long time. We thought, well, it's the squad and it's those crazies. Is that getting bigger? I think it's getting bigger. I mean, and, and again, my, my, uh, observations are anecdotal. I haven't, you know, right. it's, it's not my field to study anti-Semitism, but you know, I look at what's happening on college campuses. I look at uh, I look at social media. Um, it's really, really ugly. And you know, look, look I I, you know, I went to Columbia, and uh, and I'm watching what's happening there now, and I'm I'm just mortified. It's it's just it's um, it's a gut punch to the Jewish people. What's happening on these? And these are the future leaders of our country. So yeah, I think it's worse than before. Getting worse, and you know, I, I'm I'm not saying it's part of the official platform of the Democratic Party or anything, but they, these tend to be Democrats, uh, and and the politicians who uh, need to court their votes are getting softer and softer on Israel to the point of being, in many cases, now hostile. And how do you see this current administration? You know, they were very supportive right at the beginning of the war. Now we feel that they're kind of pushing Israel into not finishing the job, into I mean standards that I don't think anybody has ever lived up to the standards they're trying to get us to at the moment in terms of humanitarian aid and other things. Do you think this is actually damaging or do you think it's just part of the political rhetoric and and conversations that uh, that we have and we see in the press all the time? I, th I think it's um, becoming extraordinarily damaging in, in the very short run. I'm not talking about the long-term political horizons, but look, um, Hamas knows that it can't defeat Israel militarily, right? So what was their strategy? They inflicted this massive uh, assault, barbaric assault on the Jewish people. And now the question that they're asking themselves is, you know, can we survive this? Can we survive with a few battalions in Rafah? Can we 
survive with our lives? Can we survive with our money? Yeah. And when they calibrate that, it's all by reference to what they're hearing is happening in America. Because the only one that can stop Israel from completing the job is Joe Biden. Yeah. Right? He's the only one. And so the more that Joe Biden or Tony Blinken or any of these guys gets up and talks about indiscriminate bombing or over-the-top actions or demands a ceasefire, it causes the price for the hostages to go up. Yeah. It causes Hamas to be emboldened. And it's prolonging the very thing that these Democrats want to end. So what we're seeing here is a combination of, of bad policy and, and real incompetence, you know, real incompetence. Do you have any type of sympathy that for them, they're in an electoral quandary and this is why they're doing this? I mean, is this, if the base, the Democratic voter is angry with Joe Biden already at the support that he's shown for Israel and now he's trying to kind of push back and say, no, look, I'm trying to be fair. I mean, is this what this is about? Look, you know, if you're, if you're 80 years old and you're president of the United States, I would think that, you know, what would motivate you is to do the right thing and not to, not to you know, take the, uh, the temperature of, uh, of people that you don't like and don't respect and try to get their votes. Um, I don't come from that world. You know, I, I was in politics, but only as an appointed. I never ran for anything and I never viewed the world that way. And, and uh, I don't give anybody an excuse that you can do the wrong thing because that's what you need to do to get elected. It just seems like that. It just seems that it's they're, they're working against themselves because they do want to help the hostages. We have seven, six, seven Americans in there still, sure. and they do want to end this conflict, especially in an election year. They're trying very hard to contain what could be another war in the north, and yet, like you say, the price keeps going up the more they're pressurizing Israel mm -hmm. publicly. Right. I mean, privately they could always pressurize Israel, but this public sparring. Mm -hmm. I don't see the benefit of it, uh, yeah. only electoral for, for Biden. Floor, they just gave $10 billion to Iran today. Today. Today, right? So you tell me how that helps to end the war in the North. Um, it, it, it basically finances. It finances it, right? I mean, they finance both sides of all wars. I mean, when they finance Iran, they're also financing you know, oil to Russia, which is fighting Ukraine that we're financing. So sure. it, is a, um, it, it is this um, virtue signaling policy that, that never uh, results in the end of a conflict. It just nurses these conflicts along and they try to thread needles by doing something for the, doing something for their pro-Israel Democrats and then do something for their woke Democrats and hope that they can thread the needle. Um, it, it never works and never succeeds. And that's what I think Trump's going to win by a landslide because I think what Biden has done here is to offend everybody. You know, people, yeah. you know, people on the center and people on the left. But why, what would be the benefit of, of giving Iran money? I don't understand. Are they getting the hostages back, their hostages back? Is that part of that deal? Look, when, when we left office, um, Iran was broke and yeah. Qasem Soleimani was dead. Right? The only thing Biden hasn't done is bring back uh, Qasem Soleimani. That's the only thing he hasn't done. <laughs> you know, otherwise, he's completely reversed everything we did. He's made them a very wealthy country. They've used that money to lubricate violence all throughout the, the crescent of the Middle East. And... Um, I don't know. I honestly, you know, I try to think of well, what's really in his head. What's the idea here? I mean, it's a throwback to the Obama days that maybe yeah. you can appease Iran into um, into better behavior. It will never work. It doesn't work. Um, we we saw that. We saw what Iran did after the JCPOA. After they were, uh, you know, refinanced and how they did use that money for nefarious purposes. So I honestly, you know, I try to put myself in other people's shoes. I try to see things from different perspectives. This one to me just doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense to me. Let's talk about uh, Trump for a mm -hmm. little bit. President Trump, who could very well make a comeback in these elections, he basically uh, secured his own primaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think the question on a lot of people's minds is, we know what Trump did for Israel, for peace in the region in his first administration. And then he had that little fallout with Bibi, as you know, I don't have to tell you and you don't have to agree, but Trump is an emotional person, reacted badly to Bibi. Apparently there's been a fallout. I'm not sure it's true or not. But everybody's concerned that if Trump comes back, it's not the same pro-Israel Trump, that he's kind of annoyed with us now and we don't know what we're going to get. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is sort of like, uh, you know, sewing circle chatter. I mean, it's. I don't think there's any real substance to it. Look, people ask me, what's the biggest threat to Israel? Is it, you know, is it Hamas? Is it Hezbollah? Is it Iran? To me, the biggest threat to Israel is that America continues to go on this path of weakness. It ceases to lead the world. 
It loses its respect around the world. People aren't afraid of America. That's the biggest threat to Israel, not just to America. Absolutely. And that's where Trump, I think, is is good for Israel, primarily. Like, you know, on a particular policy, you could ask me, you know, what's he going to do with the MOU? Is it going to be higher or lower? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't think he's thought about it. Yeah. You know, I think that instinctively he's extremely supportive of Israel. Instinctively, he's extraordinarily hostile to radical Islamic terrorists. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think those things are, you know, deeply ingrained in him. And I think mostly he believes in a strong America. And, um, you know, that to me ought to be enough to distinguish him. Plus, of course, look, his record is like no other in terms of the past. Absolutely. So, look, I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm very, um, very comfortable with Donald Trump as president. I endorsed him. I was one of the first people to endorse him, you know, from, his, uh, from the last, uh, you know, his group from the past. Um, and and, I, and I, feel, I feel very good about him. I really do. And you're not worried about the isolationist branch of the Republican Party? Look, I think that's that's a concern. I mean, there are people, there are Republicans who think that, you know, America needs to retreat more. Um, I think a lot of that came from Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and and I understand why. Um, look, you have to look at what's happening in America. The combination of a hundred billion dollars to Ukraine to play to a tie. Right. No one's been able to explain how this money gets Ukraine to a win just to a tie. Now, a tie is the worst thing that can happen in a war. All that happens at a tie is people die. Status quo, and that's people it. did. Right, so that's, on the one hand, you're looking at that policy, and at the same time, you're looking at literally an invasion of the United States from the southern border. So, you know, people in Congress are saying, what, what can we do to stop this? You know, Trump had a you know, perfectly sane policy of closing the border in the south, and, um, and, and I, th- I think actually once the border is closed, and we stop allowing people into the country who we don't vet, who get away, who are threats to our country. Once we stop that, I think it will open up some of the isolationism. There will always be a few people, you know, who uh, Republicans have always had that yeah. small strength. It's about but, resources, you're saying. But, but, but yes, but with the, with the incredible uh, ig- ignoring the southern problem, the southern border, it is very hard to get anybody to write a check to help another country defend its border when we're not defending our border. That's an interesting insight. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done, and thank you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you, Flora. Thank you. Pleasure. And now for our favorite segment of the quad, Scumbags and Heroes. And to kick things off, I think we actually have a shared scumbag of the week this week. Um, Jonathan Glazer. Jonathan Glazer from the Oscars. I think we have a clip of, of some of his comments. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. So you see, uh, he is uh, refuting his Jewishness and the hijacking of the Holocaust. And the irony is that he's actually hijacking the Holocaust in order to promote a political opinion. But what's your take on this this scumbag? Not only hijacking the Holocaust, it's hijacking the Academy Awards, which, by the way, Jonathan Glazer are irrelevant. Um, nobody cares, yeah. but it, it's just all so dirty and smutty. You know, one of the best com. First of all, and we disown. We don't want you. You're off the team. So have fun. Bye. Um, I did invite Bye. him. Bye-bye. I did invite him to deliver his uh, apologia for Hamas to Hamas directly. And I always do this online. And you know, I'll drive you there. I'll send you off with a sandwich and a bottle of water, and you can walk into their loving embrace. But on a more serious note, there was a very good comment that I saw on Twitter yesterday contrasting um, Mia Shem's dignity and courage and Jonathan Glazer's obnoxiousness and narcissism. Now that is strength, that is power, and that is dignity, as opposed to this, what's his name, Glazer? Glazer, I know, Jonathan I know, I'm kidding. Jonathan as a, Glazer. Exactly, wait, no, I know his name, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, as opposed to this Glazer guy who gets up, you know, Mr. Big Shock, getting the Academy Award, and. He didn't even, he had to write it out and he was shaking. Yeah. yeah. Right? So brave. Yeah. yeah. I was like watching this, like, is this, is this, is this real? real? I'm like, blink three times if someone is like, you know, forcing you to do this, got a gun at your head. It's like, I've never seen assimilation like this. And I'm just like, this is like the height of, what, is, what do they call it? Stockholm syndrome? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking it's yeah. like yes. straight up vanity. Yeah. Yeah. Billie Eilish, Mark Ruffalo, all of them. Like, go away. Ugh. I just want to say that there's nothing that upsets me more 
than Jews that go against their own people. First of all, what they don't understand is that nobody respects people who don't respect who they are and don't respect themselves. In the end, Hamas respects people like us way more than people like that. Not that I care what Hamas thinks about us. But ultimately, it is the ultimate betrayal. If I was his mother, I would be sitting shiver. It's disgusting what he did. Like Emily said, he utilizes the Holocaust to make a movie to get him an Oscar mm. and then goes and victim blames the Jewish people having gone through our own mini little Holocaust. There are no words for how much of a scumbag this man is. And I just want to say something to Jonathan Glazer. Listen, mm. pal, we don't want you. But being Jewish is not like having a library card. It's not a religion. It's an ethnicity. And so you may think, you're out of the club. But let me tell you who didn't get the memo, Hitler and Sinwar. They don't care what you're renouncing. Jews in Germany in the 30s who didn't feel Jewish at all, who didn't lead a Jewish life said, hang on, we're not one of the gang. And they didn't care because being Jewish is like the Hotel California. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. I think that's that that pretty much summarizes it, but it, it is appalling. I mean, it's it's just appalling to to use the Holocaust this way while cynically claiming that you're criticizing people using the Holocaust. Like the, the level of of self delusion, it's it's sickening. I, I also replayed it several times because I couldn't believe what he had just said. And, and I saw other people commenting the same thing. But to do that at a time when there are actually hostages in Hamas captivity in the middle of a war that very clearly from Hamas's statements, from their perspective, is inherently anti-Semitic. I mean, it, he's completely yeah. tone deaf. I mean, in yeah. addition to being a complete narcissist, yeah. it's, it's just, it's unbelievably tone deaf. Even if those are your politics, I mean, there's no shortage of people who oppose occupation and oppose, yeah. uh, you know, a right-wing government in Israel, and you don't see them going around talking that way. It's, 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 it's inexcusable. So I have to say, like, um, you know, what Jonathan Glazer is, um, uh, is he's the Germans who went into the gas chambers still wearing their iron yeah. crosses from World War I and still actually believing that was going to save them right up into the last minute. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Jonathan Glazer, I did say, I think one of my social media platforms, they're coming for you first, buddy. And I hope they do. I do. And um, or alternatively, he can accept my very gracious offer to drive him to the border and send him off. And should I not welcome, one welcome. of these, yeah. not one of these people Jewish or not Jewish, goes to Hamas. I want to send them off with a Queers for Palestine flag, with whatever yes, paraphernalia yes, he just wants. Yes, put them yeah. on a bus. Will we make a bus? We'll see them all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. All the as a Jews. We could do this all day. We'll see you when yeah, you get yeah. back. Right. Not I know back. we have a couple more scumbags. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go through them very... There's so many, There's no shortage of scumbags. It's a, it's a big scum... It's a scummy it's week. It's a scummy, yeah. Yeah, scummy yeah. week. Absolutely. Yeah. So you had someone else you wanted to highlight this week. Yes. I want to put a highlight on Nigeria, but more specifically, John Momo. He is the CEO of the premier um, news network in Nigeria called Channels. He platformed Ghazi Hamad. Ghazi Hamad Hania went to uh, the Nigerian government, met with officials. He, they were supposed to meet with the vice president of Nigeria, but they had pushback from Christian organizations and the public. Um, but essentially, Ghazi went on and said, we're here because we want uh, the Nigerian government to support us. We want them to support Palestine. And the Nigerian government turned around and said, you know, we call for a ceasefire. And I find this so hypocritical in the north. Boko Haram just kidnapped how many girls? 290? Almost 300, yeah. Yeah, almost 300. Contact Michelle Obama. Yeah, almost 300 girls in addition to, you know, the, kidnaps of, the kidnapping of the girls in 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, Nigeria is important. Nigeria is the richest country on the continent of Africa. This is insane that the government is coming out in support of Hamas. Especially when they're dealing with terrorist organization so it's not yeah. like they're unfamiliar but yeah very familiar yeah. so that is yeah. my scumbag for this week Fleur who did you want to who did you want to add to our scumbags 
No, I think we've said it all, uh, and I'm really happy to keep uh, that glazer. Jonathan Glazer. <laughs> Vivian, you had one. Yeah, were you up all night, really, thinking about Jonathan Glazer? <laughs> um, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, I, I have, a, I have a, a twin, twin. I have uh, Queen Rania. Queen Rania. Oh. Uh, Jordan, and um, who has felt compelled uh, yesterday, I think, to say that, you know, like, basically, shut up already, Israel. So you had, like, one bad day. Um, you know, it's been going on for months in Jordan, in Jordan, sorry, um, been going on for months in uh, the Gaza Strip. Um, so, like, enough, you know, like the old kind of Jew victims. Israel experienced one October 7th. Since then, the Palestinians have experienced 156 October 7th. You know, they have been going through this every day. And prior to October 7th, they have uh, been living in a 50 years of oppression of occupation, of having their movement restri restricted, having every aspect of their lives dominated, uh, being humiliated. She doesn't know this, but she has a twin um, in Justin Trudeau, ring the bell, in Justin Trudeau's uh, caucus in the government in Canada. I need that bell. Um, for anyone new watching the, the show, I mention Justin Trudeau every episode because He's so special. Anyhow, her name is <laughs> Jenica Atwin. She is a member of parliament representing Fredericton, sorry, which is a place <laughs> in the east of Canada. And um, she said the same thing. And in fact, one of her constituents wrote to her about um, violence and uh, vandalizing of uh, synagogue. And she wrote back and basically said, you know, WTF, like, look what you Jews are doing. Like, I can't believe you're complaining. You know, you've been doing this for months and you're complaining about this. Like, you know, you should be thinking of the people in Palestine. So, Rania, Jenica, you're the best scumbags of the week. Okay, okay heroes. <laughs> Who are our heroes of the week? A bit more positive <laughs> note to close out this episode. Ashira, you want to start us off? Yes, my hero of the week is Floyd Mayweather. He is here in Jerusalem now receiving a, an award for what he's been doing because of the war. At the start of the war, he used his private jet to bring over 5,000 pounds of equipment for our military, for our civilians. The reason why I like that he's here now is because he did an event in Pal um, a there was a protest of pro Palestinians came to the event and harassed him. And so now him coming back to me is showing like a stance of like, yeah, you guys harassed me, you, you know, you stood out of my event, you yelled in my face, you know, called me all kinds of N words, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm still coming back to stand with the Jewish people. So I'm so proud of Floyd Mayweather. And two, he has a big hold on the culture, like on pop culture, on black culture. So I find this to be very influential and I'm very forward to you know, bring black and Jewish relations together as well. I think it's amazing that to see people responding to this bullying campaign of these protesters with a big... Yeah. And he's a finger. boxer, so he's, he's not scared. <laughs> he's not scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's not scared. <laughs> I'd like to see them mess with him. Yeah, he's like, come on. Okay, so Blair, who is your hero of the week this week? So my hero of the week is a an incredibly strong lady called Ayelet Samarano. She is a lady who discovered that her son had been murdered by those Hamas monsters on October 7th. And an UNRWA worker, a social worker, took this, the, the body of her son over to the Gaza Strip. Of course, as you do, the sick people. And she has been, at the moment, she is advocating against UNRWA and saying, look, what can be more depraved than this, than what they did? Not only did they kill my son, but the UNRWA actively took his body. The people who work for UNRWA took his body, uh, hijacked his body to the Gaza Strip. And the incredible strength you have to have to have, God forbid, lost a son, but continue to advocate for the dismantlement of the very sick and rotten organization who've taken her son's body. Hats off, there's no words. Very courageous. I also saw some of the clips of her speaking about this. Amazing. Very, very important and, and powerful. And I can't even imagine the the pain she's going through. And despite that, doing something positive for others, frankly, um, is, is really, really powerful. Uh, Vivian, who was your hero? My hero is um, a man named Ayal Eshel, the father of Ronnie Eshel. Uh, she was murdered um, horribly, all murders horrible, but she suffered particularly badly on October 7th. Ronnie Eshel was uh, a Tatsbitania, 
תצפיתנית. את נחל עוז, which was um, a base in the south, yeah. an IDF base, she was a scout. Her job was to sit there and look at these computer screens all day long. Um, women are always uh, in this role in the IDF because they say uh, that women have much greater attention to detail and they notice every little thing. Um, but what we also now know is that women are ignored. And in spite of the fact yeah. that Ronnie and all her colleagues were persistently for months making detailed reports about very concerning developments on the border, um, they were dismissed um, by their superiors who were all male. I met with Eyal Eshel last week on a park bench in Herzliya to, just to talk to him about his life since because he is another tireless advocate. And um, of course it's heartbreaking. He has two other children. She was the eldest. She was home for a holiday. She left on Wednesday before that Saturday. And as she was leaving the house, she said, Abba, Zerotech, meaning it's, it's so volatile. It's explosive there. They talked about it. She was really worried, scared because she'd been dismissed and dissed by her male superiors. And of course, her father said, honey, it's going to be okay. It's the IDF. And we have a strong army. You're going to be okay. And she went down and she picked up and start the new recruits, Naamal Levi and a few others who were just starting that weekend. It was their first weekend on base after some training. And she was to be their kind of, you know, house mother. And we all know what has happened to Naamal Levi and some of the others. And this poor father um, is so brave. And he is never going to stop until all of the rot is exposed. He said, I paid the highest price and they still don't take responsibility. He's my hero. And I'm getting, you know, goosebumps head to toe and up and everywhere again. It's really, uh... this is the only story, really. This is the story that I just think about it and it makes me cry because yeah. it exposes all the rot in society all here in one story. Right. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, it was a bit of a gloomy hero, but he's, these are our heroes. These yeah. are the people who are carrying the state now. Yep. And we need to honor them. Yep. The resiliency is uh, incredibly powerful. Um, well, I guess to close things with with my hero, uh, to bring it back to our scumbags, actually, uh, Sarah Idan, mm -hmm. who you mentioned very briefly, former Miss Iraq, she is my hero of the week. Um, and I think she is one of, if not the only person involved with the whole Oscar celebration who uh, wore something symbolic to, um, to support the release of the hostages. She actually had a dress that she designed um, that said bring them home and had the names of 19 the women the 19 women who are still oh. in Hamas captivity um, and I, I just think it's really powerful that like the one person who was very outspoken about this issue is an Arab Muslim like that says a lot about the state of of the conflict right now that this is not what the media is so eager to portray it as that the Arabs versus Jews or Israelis versus Palestinians this is something that a lot of people throughout all of the Middle East regardless of faith have a problem with the threat of terrorism. It impacts them too. And I know Sarah herself has experienced that in Iraq before she came to the United States. And so to, to see that display amidst all of the moral narcissism from people like Jonathan Glazer, who are an embarrassment to the Jewish people, exactly. <laughs> um, I, 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 I couldn't applaud her more. I, I'm very, very proud to know her um, and, and was happy to see that. And there was even a photo of her with, with Mia Shem yeah. side by side. Yeah. Really, really a powerful message that I think the hypocrites and the scumbags in Hollywood really need to, uh, to heed her, uh, her message of, of bringing them home. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to The Quad this week. Be sure to like and subscribe and share, and we'll see you next week.